welcome everybody to activating annotations in D2L. Um, this is for hypothesis and getting started with hypothesis. Uh, I'm going to share over again the bit.ly link for the slide deck. That is for you to use, uh, lose, never look at again, or um, you can take all of the links that are live in the slide deck and um, take a look at some of the, the helpful resources. Or if you go on to share any of this material with your students or other staff members, you can take any of the screenshots or any of the material and use it in your classes. Excuse me. Um, this is probably going to take the full hour. Just wanted to let you know in case you need to leave early, that's totally fine. Just write in chat if you wanted me to think about anything or um, any takeaways, but um, it usually does take that full time. Um, and afterwards, you should receive a video of this session that includes um, maybe the record of the chat and hopefully a transcript so you can slow me down, rewatch, or re-listen to certain parts if you would like. Okay. Now, if we could do some introductions in chat because this is being recorded, um, what would be great is name, um, discipline, what do you teach typically uh, in Portland? And then what is your experience with hypothesis or what is your experience with social annotation in general? I'll give you a second to get that in there. It's really great for me to know which disciplines you're coming from so I can share specific types of resources throughout the session and um, maybe point you in the right direction for anything after this. As you do that, I'm going to introduce myself. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Andre. I'm Autumn Adnad. I'm your customer success specialist. Um, that's my email right there on the screen. Um, I have a background in education. So I taught middle school and high school language arts and social studies. I have a couple of masters and then kind of switched gears to really focus on educational technology and working on a PhD in digital educational leadership. Um, I like to let you know that, that um, I'm in Seattle, Washington. Um, so I'm in the Pacific Northwest. And um, so I'm, I'm, I've been to Portland. I, I know what the city looks like and, and um, I know the weather. Yeah. I also like to let you know what the agenda will look like. Um, a little bit into um, what do we mean by social annotation, the pedagogical approaches, um, really what do some of our users say and give us feedback about how, how um, it resonates, it being hypothesis. And then what is the tool in its simplest form? What, is, what are we gonna talk about in terms of, of the technology? And then there is a course that Brian and the Portland team put together inside your D2L experience where you're gonna be able to try it out as a student. That's really a great time for you to ask questions as once you get the assignment um, created, that's not the end point for you in terms of troubleshooting, then you're gonna invite your students to come in. And so it's a great time to figure out what they will ask. And so you can ask me. Um, and then if we have time, we will brainstorm and reflect and um, I will give you a lot more resources for you to look at. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's great Google Docs, no experience. Librarian, always nice to see librarians in the house. Okay. Great. This is how I um, like to level set. <clears throat> Start with a quote. I think that's the language arts teacher in me. So I'm gonna be quiet so you can read it to yourself for a second. Okay, I'm gonna read it to you now. Online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. So I like to level set and as you're thinking about um, the team at Hypothesis, which is a small team, we, we count under 30 at this point around the world. 
Um, and But you're thinking about the co-founders in their garage, in their basement, typing away, creating a tool. Um, it's really about taking a sometimes very solo or sometimes an isolating experience of writing notes in the margin and socializing those notes. So when you approach the technology, you're going to instantaneously think about the next phase, thinking about the next, um, what else can it do? So I say, share those thoughts with me. And that's how we build our, our public pro product roadmap, um, which you can see. And, um, but I'm gonna kind of show you what it does right now. And then, um, we, then we can think about the future as well. So we like to start with uh, the three pieces that really float to the top when it comes to hypothesis and teaching and learning. While I'm going over this, I don't know exactly what you're looking at on your screen. You could potentially be listening and, and carefully paying attention, or you could be having an experience setting up your own um, space in your D2L with Portland and could be trying it out. Um, or you could be looking through the slide deck. Whatever works for you in terms of a learner, that's fine. Um, but I am gonna go over the, the three pieces um, that kind of come to the top in terms of pedagogy. I, I would say that this is not all the ways that you could approach hypothesis. Um, there was a reading teacher on here just on Wednesday from Portland who you know, brought up so many different concepts and it, when you um, start talking about annotation. So um, these are just three. And when it comes to that, there was a recent article that referred to these three as our motto. That's, that's not what we say internally, but I'll share the article with you if you'd like to take a look at that. The first one is hypothesis makes reading active. In the background here, you'll see an actual screenshot of an instructor's uh, public facing web page where they put Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem, Love is Not All. And then you're able to see the layer of hypothesis pop onto the screen where there is a student's annotation, JT Lara, where they've added a piece of multimedia or a meme into the conversation about the poem. Um, and then we'll go ahead and read the quote to you. I want students to learn the profits and pleasures of careful, engaged reading, to cultivate this kind of reading and learning. I've tried a lot of previous annotation tools, but Hypothesis finally delivers on the promise of digital annotation. That's from a professor from uh, San Francisco State. So that's a public facing web page with Hypothesis on top of it, making reading active. You can see all the activity on there with the yellow. The second screenshot is uh, making reading visible. And you can see here that this is a different type of text that you might share with your students, an academic heavy text that you've uploaded, it's a PDF. Um, and then you can see everywhere where there's yellow, there's annotations connected to it. So it can become your, your heat map as you're opening this document and seeing where the conversations are happening. Or you can go in preemptively and add in stopping points, like either you're defining um, known quantities of, of confusing vocabulary, or you can go in and say, hey, stop right there. Did you just read something very important? Did you miss the theme? Did you see the theme? Where was it? Uh, so you can kind of build in that scaffolding for them. Um, this quote, their annotations give me a window to their thoughts and understandings that I couldn't uh, access otherwise. I wouldn't get this depth of interaction in a threaded discussion. And that's from a professor from uh, The Ohio State. Um, I think specifically thinking about my middle schoolers and high schoolers, this would have given me a, a really great idea of where people are getting confused and maybe potentially where I could start for some reteaching the next day if they were doing this as homework. So it would have been a, a good experience for me to see that. And then hypothesis makes reading social. Uh, this quote is actually from an undergrad. Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this brilliant tool, I know I'm not alone. This is also where I like to share my little, my little anecdote, I guess, as an undergrad. I was a English literature major and a history minor. And so loving to read is kind of innately built into that, or you have to at least like it a little bit. Um, but when it came to the live classes, we saw each other maybe once or twice a week. Um, 
I didn't always feel like my voice was necessary or was um, the one that was getting called on. So I really think that something like this would have allowed me to communicate with my instructor and let them know um, that I did do the reading and I had something to say, but in that really short window, maybe I didn't get to be heard in that moment. So just like socializing that experience again and giving a different opportunity to, to different folks. So the, the KB articles, that's what we refer to, knowledge base is always growing, um, ever expanding. This is just a few of them that pertain more to teaching and learning and maybe not so much to the how-to. I would definitely direct you to the partner created resources link right there on that list. Uh, that is a Google Doc of instructor or instructional designers or librarians creating material uh, for the use of Hypothesis at their school and then sharing it back to us at Hypothesis, allowing it, us to then share it back out to new partners. Uh, so you're going to be able to see what it is and then where it's from the institution and then who made it. Um, it's some of it is is LMS specific, but some of them are very generalized pieces. I would highly recommend looking at that if you're thinking about creating any professional development or you you want resources. Okay, annotating with hypothesis. This is that part by what do we mean? What is our some of our technology? What are some of our terms? And and really, what is the tool in general? trying to get to the experimental space. That's usually the, the best for you to actually try it, get your fingers on it and see it live. Um, yeah, the, the course that Brian just shared again. So in essence, you are taking an experience where you're writing by hand with a pencil um, marginalia. So that's what we refer to the margin notes. And you're taking it online and you're taking it to a space where students and staff members can be annotating together. So what you will need to do is you'll, you, you'll need a trackpad, um, a mouse or your fingers, because we know students are using Hypothesis with mobile devices and tablets. Uh, and there are some keyboard shortcuts. So, so if, if somebody wants to know that, I can, I can grab that. But um, what in essence is you will take your, your mouse and you will take some text and you'll roll it over the text. Two tools will pop up. One is the annotate tool and one is the highlight tool. Hopefully it's, it's uh, pretty intuitive which one is the highlight tool as it should look kind of like a highlighter, I don't, you know, uh, hopefully. And then the, ones with the, the one with the quote in it, the quote marks in it is the annotate tool. The annotate tool will then pop open a rich text box. It will bring the hypothesis layer onto the screen and you and your students will add something to the text. You'll annotate the text. Um, that being a comment, a question, uh, whatever you have asked them to do. And then they will post it. They, they can either post it to um, themselves privately or they can post it to the course. And then there's the reply. So you're able to reply to your own annotations. You're also able to reply to any of the students. The students can reply to your annotations and they can reply to each other. Uh, the one cool thing I, I really like about the replies in Hypothesis is that the replies have all the same formatting options. So say they originally uh, annotated with a piece of multimedia, the student can then reply with a similar type of multimedia. So it has all the same bells and whistles in the reply as the original annotation. Um, so it's pretty simple in, in that sense. And I think that, that that's what you and your staff and students will see that it, it is pretty simple. Um, and they've actually probably participated in similar actions with technology if they've been in any type of um, social media, Reddit threads, um, if they participated on comments on social media as well, their students, your students may have actually tried similar actions. Okay, so we do have a in the wild browser extension that anyone can use and sign up for with a, an email. So it's free, but we suggest trying it in education in your LMS that your institution uses because your students 
and staff are automatically signed in. Um, we do not get their email addresses. Uh, we use whatever the, um, the LTI provides us. So the way that we make the integration. And it also creates that experimental space, those private groups within the course where students can, you know, try things out uh, with, the, with the staff member and really get a hang of that type of communication style. Um, and then it also works with the grade set. Um, there are some very specific pieces with the grade bar. This, this grading bar will only show up for the instructor, none of the students. Um, and it will enact the student in the roster when they have created their first annotation. So where it says all students, you'll be able to see your list of students as, as they create their annotations. And the grade will always be out of 10. But if you put it in the grade book out of 25 or out of 35, it's going to create some sort of percentage. So um, say you make it out of 100 in your grade book, but you give the student a 7 out of 10, that will create the percentage of a 70% in the grade book. Um, so if your staff members use the grade book with uh, Hypothesis and D2L, there are some little things. I added a note into the, the notes of this deck too, if you want to talk to them about that. It's also in our knowledge base articles. Okay, what can you annotate? Uh, PDFs, web pages, online articles, open text and OER. Uh, and I always like to emphasize that most things can be turned into PDFs. This slide deck, for example, can be downloaded as a PDF and then you can use it with Hypothesis, PowerPoints, Google Docs, um, everything like that. And the other one that's come up a lot recently is you. there's a lot of free tools out there where you can merge PDFs. So um, the example that's come up quite a bit is I want my students to choose two of the four readings and annotate them. Um, so if you merge the four texts into one PDF and post it into that assignment, then you just say the students choose two. Worst case scenario is they maybe read more, um, but that is, that is an option as well. One thing to bring up here, um, anything that's behind a paywall, this will come up when I show you how to create the, the uh, content, doesn't necessarily work with hypothesis. So you'll wanna work with your staff about um, New York Times, right? That is potentially, or LA Times, or you know, most of those, those news articles that are behind paywalls, those won't function properly within Hypothesis, typically. And then what can you put in the annotation? Uh, like I said, you, it's not just text, it's uh, multimedia as well. So links, tags, emojis, uh, LaTeX, LaTeX language, images and GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you like to, it to be heard or said. Um, and then videos, you can use the share URL and a thumbnail will pop up. So it's pretty uh, dynamic in that sense. And then the last piece I'm gonna share before we jump into the sample course is our, our free OCRing tool. So OCRing uh, optimizes your PDFs so they can be um, recognized uh, when you pull over with your mouse. If you've ever been in an older PDF and you try to highlight one word and the whole thing uh, highlights, that means the PDF might be pretty old. Some of the older scans uh, are, are not really optimized. So if you find that your students or, or yourself are struggling with something like that, um, use our free OCRing tool and you can make it a little bit better for them. Okay, so this is the other side of the knowledge base. It's all these how-to articles, how to create, how to grade, um, and then like the student guide. Okay, let's jump into the sample course. So this is what it looks like on my side. I'm gonna give it a refresh. So just in case people were enrolled. Um, I am obviously an instructor here. So this is what it looks like for me, but you should have these general resources and then um, hypothesis resources down here. These hypothesis resources are all helpful links. Uh, this first one is if you wanna meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. 
uh, this is to our liquid margins webinars, uh, the knowledge base articles, partner workshops. It's all supposed to be just helpful tools. And then also um, the workshop slides that we're working on from today are linked up there. Up here are three examples of hypothesis that I've enabled in different ways. Uh, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with one perspective on student-centered learning. So if you'd want to, if you're in this course and you're in, in content, if you wanted to click on that one perspective on student-centered learning, it should open. You might have to click authorize, that's, that's okay. Uh, but the best case scenario for you, if you're gonna use Hypothesis with staff or students is for you to try it with us right now. So uh, I'm going to do it live as well. Um, and I'm gonna use the getting started guide here. So the getting started guide is under the question mark. It should pop up for you if this is your first time using Hypothesis. Uh, and so let's follow the directions. Step one, to create the annotation, select text and then select the quote annotate button. Step two, to create a highlight visible only to you, select text and then select the marker or highlight button. Step three, to reply to an annotation, select the curved arrow reply button. So I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna highlight some text. So for me, it turns a purplish periwinkle color when I highlight text. And then two tools. So I'm gonna click the annotate tool. And then my rich text box pops up. My name should be connected to the annotation, the text that I highlighted, my formatting options and um, multimedia options. The question mark should take you to some formatting help. If you need any formatting help, I'll share that over with you. And then the box to add material. Um, in this specific one, I'm going to add a hyperlink. Here are some. So I'm going to click the chain link here. I'm going to paste that. And here are some DISTI student standards. Okay. Um, tags are optional. Don't have to add a tag if you don't want to. And then you're going to want to emphasize with your students to click this button right here. They'll have two options, click to the class or click to themselves. So it's truly private to them. And that's fine too, because um, they can always edit it afterwards. But if you want to see it as the instructor, you'll want to say post the class. Voila. So let me know in the chat if you're in here, if you're trying it out. Oh, I know someone is. Okay, so how do I know that someone has added an annotation? It's because up here, there's the red down arrow with the half circle. It says show one new updated annotation. So I can click that. And then by default, it organizes the annotations by location on the page. That means top to bottom. But I'm gonna be able to click newest. And Robin added an annotation. Yes, I know I'm not alone. Yes, okay, that's great. And Laura, okay, that also is telling me so many things. This is functioning. Um, you know, you were able to get into the course. Thank you. Now, if you made your first annotation, I would definitely try the highlight, try the reply, and then also try the multimedia. It's the multimedia is the place that you or your students might get uh, a couple of stumbling blocks, but maybe not. Show me, show me, show me what you got. Um, okay, at the top here, I do want to show you a couple of navigation pieces. If by chance your students come in here or you are sharing your screen and you're just like the yellow is just too much, it's it's a lot of activity. Uh, if you click this little greater than hash mark up here at the top. It takes the layer off the page. And then if you click the eyeball underneath, it takes the yellow off the page. Nothing is gone, it's just hidden. So in case that you have a student or yourself wanna look at it 
with all the busyness, without the busyness, you can click that. It'll come back. And then for those folks that are using this on a tablet or mobile device, you can recommend that they click and hold. It makes the annotation window very large or very, very small. So it depends on the ratio for the screen, whatever they feel uh, works for them. The spyglass at the top is your very strong search tool. So I can search by name. There's Robins, pops up. I can also search by tags. So I, I used the diagram tag on this one. So I would, I would definitely, if you're looking, say that you um, saw your annotations from your students, you gave one of the students a nudge, like, hey, um, Bobby, go back in and add a little bit of quality to your annotations or add a little bit more for your interpretive ones, um, whatever it might be. And you wanted to have it the, the newest on the board, that's a good way, or you could just search for Bobby's annotations. The big question mark is the getting started window that also leads you to the help or support tickets. So after you open Hypothesis for the first time, it shouldn't come back on your screen, but if you ever wanna get back to it, it should be right there. Still have old annotations at the top. So it's not going to automatically uh, update. We never wanted to interrupt a student's thought as they are potentially writing a whole essay in their annotations. <laughs> so uh, you should see the little red at the top. And if you don't, and you've already posted your annotation, so make sure you've posted whatever you want to write, just give it a refresh. So refreshing or leaving the page, well, that didn't necessarily work. That, that is the way to pop back in. And that should update all the annotations, all the new ones will come up on there. Cannot find Robins. So did you try the search at the top? You search for Robin, it doesn't come up at all. And did you give the refresh? Try the refresh. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go to multimedia to make sure I show this in the recording and then I'll come back. Okay, I'm gonna go to my, I think they're the old, some of the oldest, yeah. Okay, so here's some of my annotations. You can see my name, you can see the original timestamp and then the edited timestamp. So I originally made on April 7th and edited on April 15th. The text it's linked to, it should take you to it if you click it. And then the image here. We use image URLs. So if I'm looking at this diagram, no matter really the size of your screen, this is a little too small. You can expand the size of the, the hypothesis toolbar to make it larger. But I would also, I'm on a Mac, so if I double click there, I can open image in a new tab. And that way you really can actually look at whatever is small there, if it's got a lot of detail uh, versus, I think if I went to location, you might not need to zoom in on this one, right? From Michael Moss, but you might with this one. Now I'm going to, you also should see that I have the tag diagram, that's optional. Because it's my annotation, I have three tools at the bottom. I have edit, I have delete, and I have reply. So I can get very metacognitive and I can have a really long conversation with myself if I want, and that's totally fine. If you click the delete, this prompt comes up, and if you click that delete, it is gone. So just let your students know as well that deleting is pretty permanent uh, and make sure they wanna do that. So I'm gonna click reply and I'm going to reply with another piece of multimedia here. And I'm navigating a couple of screens. So if I look over on the side, I'm, I'm pulling my other piece up. So uh, I'm gonna click this little tiny picture and in the parentheses, I'm going to paste the image URL and in the brackets, I'm gonna put in the alt text. So uh, student, Centered learning diagram. And then I'm gonna add a tag. Optional, but you can. 
And far as you know, try to refresh if it is. It can we open it up in some different browser. It really depends. I think that what is happening because we're in here right now doing this live, what the functionality wants you to do is, is that red down arrow pop up and click that down arrow. It doesn't necessarily want you to do the refreshing um, on that screen. Uh, so that's I think that's part of it. So you see here, that's how the image pops up. I'm gonna show you that. That's what this looks like when it's a little bit larger. Okay, I'm going to show you one other piece here, um, the GIF. So the GIF is exactly the same. You use the same picture tool. Uh, I always like to show this with instructors because you cannot disable GIFs or GIFs. You can tell your students to that this is a good time to use uh, the animated GIFs or it's not a good time. Be explicit in your instructions if they annoy you. Uh, some people just really don't like them. Sometimes it's the right type of flavor for the assignment because you're being playful or it's okay. Um, I also have some, some staff members who are using different tools where students are creating their own GIFs, their own videos that pertain to, to the material. So it really depends. Um, I'm gonna show you, I, I pull these from Jiffy, but I'm not gonna go there live because it's a public facing web page and have faced some pretty offensive material on recorded workshops before. So uh, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna paste in this other GIF and I'm gonna again bring in the alt text into the bracket. So this is a animated GIF of a changing color full ice cream. And that's a GIF. This is optional, just, just adding it in there. There you go. You, yeah, you can't turn off GIFs. Okay, and then videos. So if I, I edit this one, I just went to uh, YouTube. I copied the share um, share URL option, and then um, I pasted it in here. And then it's a thumb a thumbnail right there. Now, um, I always like to share the example that the 400 level French instructor uses. Um, she was having them hit all the levels of literacy. So reading the text in French, typing or writing in French in the hypothesis annotations. And then she was having her students video themselves speaking French, uploading the videos and then sharing them here so the students could um, listen to each other speak French about the text. Uh, that was 400 level French class. And that also has some expectations of the students be able to use some technology. We have an example internally we're working on and I recorded myself about a piece of text using Zoom and then I uploaded it to YouTube. I, I, that was the way that I did it. Um, I would also say to your students, if they say, I don't know how to record myself, that ask them if they've ever made a reel, ask them if they've ever used TikTok, uh, that all requires them to know how to record themselves. So just a concept that, uh, you know, code switching from the social space to the more academic space, maybe. Um, any questions about the multimedia? Have you had a chance to try it? Do you want to try it? This is also, um, this is what the hyperlinks look like. They do always come in as red. So there's no changing the color, but I, that's kind of how it would be. And then if you clicked it, it should take you to a new tab and that's kind of whatever the material is, it should pop up. So at the top, you'll, you'll maybe notice that there's annotations and page notes. Annotations are all linked to text. So if I click the text, it'll take me to where it is in the page. So if I hover over that, Laura's right there, it should take me to where it is. If I click page notes, I added a page note as an example, but page notes are not linked to text. So if I click this little post-it right here, this folded note post-it, then I can create a new, new page note. Why might you use a page note? Uh, context, um, 
Maybe you're talking about imagery in a poem and you want to provide pictures. Maybe you want to provide autobiographical information about um, the poet. Um, or like how I used it, I just provided directions. I also heard an instructor recently who said that there, they had two students in the annotations go on a 30 back and forth uh, tangent, not connected to the text. And so eventually she asked them to take their side conversation to page notes. That's an option. It was just making the general annotation conversation a little too uh, busy. Okay, um, last thing I wanna show you is the notebook. If I go up here to the tip top corner and I click on the human uh, icon or the little hash next to it, you'll see your name and then you can click open notebook. This is a place where all of your annotations will live for everyone. This will look the same for both instructors and students for all your hypothesis enabled documents or web pages or OER. They can get to this content anyways by just going directly to the content item or their assignment. But this is where the annotations can live in a collective notebook. Now, um, this is everyone's. So if I scroll down, this is everybody's. You also can navigate to yourself and take a look at your content that you've contributed. Um, the way they're, they're organized is the name, when it happened, uh, the, the document it's linked to, the text that was highlighted, and then what was contributed. I have a chemistry instructor who uses this, the everybody one, and with all new terms, all new glossary terms, they use the same tag, which I think was term or new term or glossary, and they were directing their students to the notebook to help them study for their midterm. And then I had an English instructor who was directing to their students to go to the notebook and navigate to themselves and use, they, they had it over four or five different documents and use those annotations as a skeleton for the analysis paper or the synthesis paper, you know. So they have their quote potentially, and then they have their commentary or their thoughts on that quote. Those are just two limiting ideas. If you have other ideas, um, you know, go for it. I, I just think that we wanna make sure that you know it's there because your students might happen upon it. Okay, so a lot of features. A lot of pieces there. Um, now I'm going to go into the content creation. A couple of things. Um, I am a collector of tabs. I mean, I've only been with you for, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And how many do I already have? I have so many extra windows open. Um, I feel like a dragon with a horde. So uh, that's one option when you open it and you like it actually pops into a new tab. This other example, annotating poem, those winter Sundays, is gonna open in the same frame. And you can decide whether you like that for your students. Um, I know that with my middle schoolers, anytime that it clicked them out of the frame of their LMS, I might lose them because 13, you know, I might just lose them to some something else on the internet. Uh, so you wanna keep them in that frame. If you use this tool right here, it can open a new window for them. So that, that's a possibility. It really depends on how you want it to function. Uh, I like the full page new window, new, new tab, I apologize, new tab. So that's, it's all dependent. And that's under the, um, I'll show you once I pop back content. If you go right here under edit properties in place, and then there's open as external resources, how you would have it as a new tab piece. Okay. Now I'm gonna share a link with you that's pretty important to creating hypothesis content in uh, D2L. That's this link. This link isn't going to take you anywhere. It's not gonna take you anywhere. It's just important when you're doing the creation. So you'll wanna save that somewhere. I'm gonna open up this one. And I'm going to do existing activities for some reason. I want to get to 
Mm. Taking me. Let me go back to course home. And go to content. Okay, so if I go to existing activities, and then I go down to external learning tools. And then I scroll down. So I, I might have been too quick there. So I'm going to go existing activities. I'm going to go external learning tools. So I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to create new LTI link. Create new LTI link. Then I am going to put in the name of the assignment that I want to use. So I'm going to grab, grab the one I want to use. And, and then I'm going to grab that URL I just shared with you to put in the LTI URL. Once you use it once, it automatically kind of pops up in your in your URLs. But I always want to make sure you have that, okay? And then create an insert. Now you're not done. I'm going to edit it right now. Make sure when I'm done there, it does that. Opens in a new resource. I'm going to give it a refresh. And I'm going to click right here. Annotating poem in American Sunrise, and it's going to give me my options. Okay. Now this goes back to making sure whatever you share with them is open. It's a PDF. It's a you know whatever it is. Um, these are the options you're going to have in front of you. Enter URL or web page or PDF, and that's the one that you want to make sure that's not behind a login or paywall. Select PDF from Google Drive. Select PDF from OneDrive. Then if you click this Google Drive option, it's going to link to your Google Drive potentially. This upload will pop up. And this upload will also pop up if you click the OneDrive option. This upload is uploading from your desktop, your downloads, your um, uh, documents. And then I have a lot of things living on three thumb drives that I have hooked up to my computer. So that's where you could potentially pull material from as well. I'm going to take this one from a web page. And I like Poetry Foundation because it is pretty stable. It's open. I don't think it's gonna be going away anytime soon. Uh, you have to think about that too. If the content you share with your students is suddenly gone, if they posted annotations on material that has changed, we can recover the annotations, but it is pretty difficult. You have to contact our support team. So imagine, you know, somebody decides to just completely edit a news story that was breaking. Um, the words that they annotated are then changed on that web page. Uh, so, because everything's linked to that text, just make sure that it's stable, open, um, and, and ready for that end user, your student. So that's really it. And then it should pop open here. And it should be ready to go for you and your students. And that's really what it looks like uh, for them and yourself. So if I were to go back over here to the course and I go to content and I would click this or, or you as a student in this course would click this, um, it should open up as a new tab and you should be able to see it and open it as well and add annotations. Okay. Anything about the content creation that you have questions about? This is the best step-by-step -step guide we have for creating hypothesis enabled readings in D2L. I just shared in chat. Um, it does have a nice video with it and um, the step-by-step -step guides. And it also has that uh, URL, that LTI URL you'll need to use. Okay. And Autumn, I just wanted to chime in real quick. The the mm -hmm. open as external resource, that's kind of key for us um, with external learning tools. And I think even with hypothesis testing, if if we don't pick that, sometimes um, it just won't work for the instructor or students if they need to like authenticate with their like um, G drive, that access. So pretty much all of them, 
even though it's a little bit cleaner, if you don't pick that and it opens just within that window, you really want it to jump to a new tab. I agree, that's my preference as well. I just don't wanna make anybody do anything. <laughs> uh, this format, formatting piece is really important to have on hand for your students as well. If you know anybody in technology, math or science that might be using Hypothesis, this page is specifically important if they intend to use it with LaTeX, LaTeX language. Um, I'm not gonna embarrass myself and read this notation, but it can get to this point. Uh, so, you know, if you are using it with staff that, that wants to do that, please share that with them. It expands it potentially outside of just, um, you know, writing in a language um, to, with typical characters. Okay. So I'm gonna pop over here with some, um, our six ways to kind of get started and then we can have some quick Q and A at the end. Um, so we have these ways to get started. Something to keep in mind as you're using a hypothesis, it, it's an annotation tool really about the community. It's really about creating those cohorts. I have a cohort that I'm still working with and um, it's really nice to keep everything together with them. Um, I rely on them. We, we share all of our material and we work off of our research. So um, it's really about creating more of that uh, that's directly linked to the text. We always recommend starting with something that potentially isn't aligned with grading. So it's potentially a syllabus, a newsletter. I used to hand annotate with my middle schoolers, their first rubric for their first essay, you know, the first bigger essay for eighth graders, ninth graders. And um, that helped me too, because when it came to them and how they were graded, we always had that annotated syllabus where they did see it, you know? Um, I didn't know how that I was gonna be graded on that, doesn't come up as much. With syllabus, think about those kids who missed out on that $50 that was in that locker. Um, for those that finished reading the syllabus. Potentially you could go through and you could highlight some pieces that you know your students um, don't read their first go through, uh, deadlines, don't forget that type of material. My doctoral handbook is a hundred and something pages. I really wish that would have been hypothesis annotation enabled, that would have been helpful. <laughs> Uh, so oh, we have a resident scholar and he has a blog and he talks about annotating the syllabus. He also has a book, Remy Kalir, if you um, are interested in some of his material. We recommend just trying it out, um, making it annotation enabled and seeing how they go um, in terms of traditional books, stories. There's a lot of material out there that you could try out. We had one instructor who was working through COVID and had traditionally used Jane Eyre as their summer reading. And so they found it free online and they did chapter by chapter readings with their students. It worked for her. Um, it sounded fun in my perspective. Um, and that was the full concentration was like a uh, readers writers conference type of material. Guide your students through the reading as they go, um, keep them engaged. This is, we have some partner workshops and this is one of our, um, the topic of one of our more advanced ones is that, you know, hypothesis is not just for um, remote hybrid high flex classes. It can also really make your in-class discussions more dynamic or student forward. So you have them create those annotations with hypothesis and then you use those questions the students created or the comments as your jumping off points or you have them um, take on roles so that when they are face-to-face, -face, they are leading the discussion from the get-go. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. The sky's the limit. And um, we've, had, we've seen a lot of creative ways to use hypothesis when you're in a face-to-face -face setting. This one is my favorite. Uh, I think that instructors, lecture notes, and slide decks are pure gold. I wouldn't have passed my comp without my professor's lecture notes and slide decks. So, you know, make them a PDF, put them into um, your LMS, make them annotation enabled, and see if anything comes up. 
I would also say I used to work with bilingual and trilingual students, and it might give them a second chance to digest some of the text. It's hard when someone is speaking as quickly as some of my uh, brilliant professors do to kind of get all of that at, at that moment. So I, I would just say you have you are the expert. You have so much to to share. So you know, put it on there, see what happens. And then the pilot and subscription program, we do have technical support. Is there anything that you face that you are seeing an error with? Anything you wanna bring up with our technical support, please don't hesitate to do so. Uh, we have a tight knit group here. And then for the pedagogical support pieces, uh, there are a lot of guides out there. I offer one-on-one -on -one consultations where you share your screen with me. And then I say, yes, you've got it usually, cause you do. And then uh, we have these different types of webinars as well that you can attend. And yeah, if you don't wanna email me directly and I shared that on like the second slide, please go ahead and, and email this really easy to remember one success at hypothesis. And I will more than likely respond to you. And we can, if you need resources, if you wanna have a, uh, a session just for your staff, whatever it might be, I can definitely help out. Okay, so that's all that I have for, for my material, for the recording and everything else, but I would love to open it up for Q&A if anybody wants to know anything that I can maybe and hopefully help with on this Friday midday. Nothing as of right now, pretty quiet. I think it was super helpful, Autumn. You're really clear. You gave us a lot of links. Um, I think uh, I think you did a great job, and I'm excited to start playing with it. Love to hear that. That's a nice way to end the week. <laughs> uh, I I know I did see some questions in in the chat. Um, let me know if any of those didn't get reconciled at the very beginning. Someone was trying to see Robin's annotations. I hope that you were eventually able to. I think this Alvin the chipmunk is actually Brian. So if you're wondering that if we have a chipmunk in the, in the room. Yeah, Autumn, that not... was me looking for the for the annotation. What happened was that those little arrows up and down that are between the magnifying glass and the question mark, mm -hmm. I needed to click that. So I, I was looking for how to organize it by newest. And once I did that, oh. it worked. But I was stuck on the old ones scrolling down uh, okay. continuously, but no, I, I did get it to work. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really good piece to tell your students about too. If they're, if they need to come in and they add all their annotations, but one of the part of the assignments is to add in replies, they might need to just pop in after that and, and see newest and, and figure out who they want to reply to. I just had some quick, just housekeeping things, just more PCC related to hypothesis. Um, so we're technically still in a pilot, um, but in your courses right now, you can basically do what Autumn was showing you, taking that one hypothesis LTI link and create assignments. Um, and it's hypothesis LTI 1.1, but I think like mid-June, it's going to 1.3. So probably before summer term starts during the break, we'll switch that out. So I don't know how like the interface may change at all, but there'll be some background changes. Um, and we also have a document in the hypothesis resources, little module is the last one. And that's more kind of PCC specific stuff. A lot of the stuff Autumn um, has, it's, it's a little bit of a duplicate, but more specific to our detail instance. And if you check back with that, um, Google, doc we'll be updating that as we get other stuff and that has the links to do like a one-on-one -on -one with autumn or her colleague if you wanted to do like a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one, like instructional design thing creating something um so brian are you saying so say i want to start this next week do i do that in the hypothesis shell you've created for all of us or is there a way to do that in my class right now you can do it in your class right now um it's actually turned on for pretty much every course, okay. um, but the timing of the start of term and rolling it out because of procurement, um, we didn't want to just kind of like turn it on and then not have people supported. So 
theoretically you could do it in your live course with live students um there's just as you can see there's a little things you know that you would need to know and you know the grade book has some quirks things like that um so you can totally start creating a hypothesis assignment like my suggestion this is just me i'd maybe create it hide it and then run it by maybe like somebody with hypothesis and go hey okay this is what i've did done does this look like it's gonna work and we can actually enroll like you know like some test student accounts in your live course and really quickly turn it on i would do this for no i would never do this for a grade or just sort of a pass fail sort of thing but i could i could see doing it in class to have a discussion about say a sample essays flaws and benefits and i want them to do it in class with me i wouldn't care so much about the grade book but is there like a place to create when i go to create assignment is hypothesis an option in the drop down menu right now no so i would i would watch maybe at like the 35 minute mark of this video when we sent it out it'll probably go out monday honestly um and i think autumn is showing right now so you have to go to the external learning tools but you have to scroll all the way down to create new lti link and then you title it and then where it says lti url that is one specific link that you always have to use for every hypothesis assignment so this is not the PDF or the web page. This is before that step. Right. Um, and that's actually in the um, the hypothesis text annotation faculty help sheet. That's the walkthrough of creating an assignment. Um, sure. So you really want that at your side because if you get to this point, I've done it, you know, a dozen times just kind of doing a trial. Like, I'm like, oh, what, where's that link? <laughs> so yeah, you would just do external learning tool, just like Autumn showed, you put that link in and then you would pick here um, you know, whether it's going to be an open non paywall web page and also one that's maybe persistent, you know, it's, um, if it's like a New York times, like open one, I think right. it's paywall with them. They may change it in a week. They may shorten the link. Um, and I don't know how autumn feels, but I, th I think you're kind of the same mind. Like you probably want to just make it a PDF. If it's something you think you're going to use long-term or you don't want a surprise, like in a week or a couple of weeks or something. And the PDFs that are made now, we don't need to do a whole lot for them to be readable. Do we still have to go through, um, you know, do we have to tag it in certain ways? Or like if I just made a PDF of something off the web, would that be good to go? I mean, I've, I've been in the early days, I was told not to use PDFs in the uh I don't know. I use, I use the, I cre either create a file in slides or I create a file in the, um, in the tool within the text, within the class. Yeah. Um, well, and what Autumn's kind of pulled up. So one, one of the problems you can run into, you know, a PDF can be like a text readable PDF where it's like, you know, you're in word and you, you know, you type up some paragraphs and then you just export it as a PDF or you are in another program and you send it, you do, you do file print and you save it to mm -hmm. the Adobe PDF printer. That usually, not all the time, but that usually converts all the text to like, you know, readable PDF text, but you can have a PDF, um, you know, it's like, it's like some Magna Carta and there's text on there, <laughs> but it's not actually text. It's just an image. And that's probably why in the past, and honestly, like even with some of the OCR stuff, you have to be careful because it's not always like a completely like one-to-one -one, like mm -hmm. you know sometimes there's an artifact where it doesn't read that f or it thinks it's an s or whatever so i think if you're starting with text and you save it as a pdf that's fine it's just there are problems where like you know if it's a new york times article and you try to save that as a pdf then yeah the image that comes over you know that's that's still going to be an image you know and you can't always tell because on the web page it looks like text but it's actually an image of text. Like the headline is, is you know, not going to get converted unless you do the OCR. I gotcha. Thank you. All right. Well, we're right at top of, uh, not top of the hour, but 1130. I don't want you to stay any later than you need to. Um, again, I shared my one-on-one -on -one link. If you want to grab some time with me, if you want some extra, uh, that's also available. And then you'll have the video soon as well that Brian can send out. Um, so I think that's, that's about it. Unless there's anything else you need, Brian. No, that was great. Autumn. Thanks again. Um, I did have a little quick, like 22nd, like send off just with Laura was mm -hmm. talking about not making it a gradable item. 
that's that's great. Um, the only problem is when it's when it's created, you know, and I think you know in D2L you can't you can't create a zero grade item. You got to do like 0.01. Um, but then what you can do is you can just not grade it, and then just make sure your grade book treats zero as like not counting against them. So that's the thing. But Brian, I have things that aren't assessed. I have assignments that I forget to assess and then I have to stick them in my grade book later. Yeah. And that's, and that's fine. You probably have your grade book setting where, um, treat, treat zeros as, um, what is it? Um, basically treat zeros where it doesn't, it doesn't count against the student, but to actually create a grade book item, like you have to make it, even if your plan is to give everybody zeros and it doesn't count against them in your grade book, you can't make the score zero. Like it'll go eh, and then it'll do like 0.1. Unless you found some cool way around that. <laughs> I want to share that. I'll share it with you later, Brian. You can see what okay. I'm talking about and if you see if it means the same thing. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah, because that'd be great. That would solve some other problems. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much for, for doing this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. Brian, and we can we can just follow that document that Adam sent, uh, uh, the last part, that last document for creation, the uh, LTI link, and then that yeah yeah that uh, that uh, address for LTI link is is working. That's what we put in our LMS, correct? Yeah, the the last document. That's that's kind of me and Melanie just kind of like aggregating some stuff. So that's the hypothesis text annotation faculty help sheet. Um, and that's oh. that's the one LTI link you want to use to get started. And then you can do, you know, your own G drive. Oh, like which is that again? Uh, is it, isn't it on the hypothesis, uh, the website? Is that one? Uh, it might be there too. I can, I think I have it up. I can just paste if it. If you could, yeah. Appreciate so it. Is, so this is the... The golden one. Golden one. Okay. Uh, golden one didn't work for me for whatever reason. Let's see. Yeah, it's, it's not going to send you anywhere. It's that one link. Yeah, it's that's what you that... paste. That's what you paste in it. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's what this you is, paste. This is, this is our knowledge base article that has that link listed in uh -huh. the directions. Oh. Oh, that so this one is on your website, correct? Um, the one I just sent in chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah that that's our public facing web page about creating hypothesis and, uh, readings in D two L, and it does list in the directions the link that Brian just Brian, shared. Brian just shared. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. just make sure I got it correctly. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. All right. I, okay. I, I have to jump actually. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Autumn's I'll, I'll busy. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah.